Um, yeah, my name is Lavani and here with me is Jonathan. We work at TransRise and uh, today we're going to talk how we have secured our Kafka infrastructure using Swift. So first, um, uh, I will briefly describe what Kafka is. Um, so Kafka is essentially a stream processing platform. We use it at TransRise as our kind of a backbone for event processing. And most of the async um, cross-service communications happen through Kafka. So it's kind of our central infrastructure that is very important for transferize. Uh, so on the Kafka side, we have um, different components and um, on the client side, we have a producers and consumers and on the kind of the management and the server side, we have a Kafka broker. Uh, Kafka broker is the one who is responsible for, to actually uh, manage the clients as well as store the data on the disks. Uh, so usually in the production, you have many Kafka brokers and they, on the broker side, we also have the notion of a topic and the topic is kind of a logical abstraction on top of the data that is stored uh, on, on the Kafka brokers. Uh, topics are sp uh, split into multiple partitions and those partitions can be on the single broker or they, be, uh, they, can, be, uh, uh, they can be on multiple brokers. Uh, and you and one partition and the and one part, one broker is a leader for a single partition. So usually clients are talking to the leader in order to like write the data to the topic. So uh, producers produce the data, and this is append only log files that Kafka manages uh, the data formats, and consumers in parallel uh, can consume the data from those from those partitions. Uh, so I won't go into all the. Like, um, details around the configuration of the brokers, but I will cover some important bits and pieces that are that is important for this talk. So we need to understand uh, before describing technical details how we have done this, how this uh, client broker co connection works. So on the broker side, we have a configuration that is called listeners, uh, and this is where you know, the Kafka broker process uh, creates the server sockets. So for example, in in this example. In this slide, we see that we create new listener called plain text internal, which binds to the port 9092. And we also have another listener, which is called SSL internal, and it binds to the port 9093. Uh, on the other hand, we have another configuration, which is called advertised listeners. And this is the configuration that is used by the clients in order to communicate to the brokers. Uh, and this should be, uh, and this must be unique uh, for each broker across the cluster. Uh, so for here, we are using DNS record, for example, Kafka zero dot internal in order to uniquely kind of reach uh, to the broker. Uh, and this is how, what the clients will use in order to communicate to the single broker. Since uh, clients need to talk to their leaders, they have to kind of reach to the particular broker. Uh, we also have a listener security protocol map and this uh, we kind of define what's our security protocols for the particular listener. Uh, here we are saying that plain text internal is a plain text, so no security and SSL internal is we expect SSL uh, on that listener. On the client side, things are a bit more boring. We just have um, just bootstrap servers and this client uses these bootstrap servers uh, in order to kind of get cluster state. So how it wor works all together, on the one side we have a broker and then we have a client. So first client will use this bootstrap servers configuration and will ask the broker, uh, can you please give me the cluster state? Our broker on the other hand will return the cluster state and uh, it will, will use advertised listener configuration for each broker to move to, and it will pass this configuration to the client. And then client will use this configuration in order to identify the leaders and how to reach the leaders on the of the partitions. So this is kind of a flow how the broker client con communication works. Um, now we have uh, covered the like basics of the connection. Now let's see how the mutual TLS can work in a traditional manner uh, for this kind of setup. Uh, so for example, we have uh, on the other hand, on one hand, we have a client with, it, with its own client key store that imports client certificate. And uh, then we have a broker with broker key store that imports broker certificate and they are signed by the same CA in this example. So how this gonna, how this mutual TLS would be established, first client will make a connection to the broker 
uh, then broker would represent a broker certificate to the client. Since we are talking about mutual TLS, client will try to verify the broker against the CA. Since they are signed by the same one, everything passes here, so we are all set. Then as a fourth step, uh, client will uh, present the client certificate to the broker and the broker will do the same one and will verify the uh, client certificate against, against the CA. And when everything is done, as a final step, the connection is established. So this is kind of a, a classical flow of how the mutual TLS, like simplify the view of how mutual TLS can be established. Um, now, this uh, setup obviously has problems. The first one is that the long-lived certificates are very hard to manage. We are at TransferWise, we have more than 300 microservices and having the kind of certificates management for each one of them would be a nightmare to manage for any platform team. Uh, then we have also diverse set of clients. Not every client and every language supports the TLS altogether, so it might not be really possible to implement something like this in uh, some languages. Uh, and it's um, like if we are talking about migration to this new setup, it would be quite hard to do uh, if we are if we have like that many microservices in our infrastructure because it would require some of the code changes uh, on the client side. So this is where we have started looking into uh, Spiffer with Spire and uh, see like how we can utilize this technology in order to automate some of the some of these processes. So let me now describe the, how it works. So for the scenery, imagine that the, on the one side, we have a microservice that runs inside the Kubernetes. And, and this microservice talks to the Envoy as a, and the Envoy runs as a sidecar. And Envoy talks to the Spire agent over SDC. So this is kind of classical setup. And on the other hand, we have a broker. And we need to make uh, this kind of connection between microservice to the broker work over Envoy, so over the proxy. So in order to do that, we for the broker side, we have to add some additional configurations. Uh, so for the listeners, we can add that, we can define a new listener uh, named Envoy, and it will bind to the port 1994. And uh, we can define advertise listeners for NY, which will be a local host 9101. Now, this is an important bit here uh, because before we have used the DNS record or maybe IP altogether to uniquely identify the broker. But now, since we just have a local host, since Envoy runs like locally on the, as a sidecar next to the microservice, we need to use different port to uniquely identify different brokers. So that's why this uh, port uh, needs to be unique for each of the brokers. Uh, and we also have listener security protocol map, and uh, we are saying that Envoy needs to be over SSL. Uh, now on the my, on the Envoy side, uh, uh, we can have as simple as like a static Envoy configs where we are mapping uh, that localhost 9101 needs to be proxied to the Kafka 0 dot internal 1994. Uh, and uh, localhost 9102 need to be proxied to Kafka 1 dot internal. So this is kind of a mapping back between the you know, ports uh, and the actual uh, Kafka brokers that are running uh, inside the infrastructure. Uh, now this with this setup, we have a kind of connection uh, figured out. So connection between the microservice and uh, Kafka broker will work over Envoy. Now we need to uh, teach Kafka brokers and to understand the SPF SPDs. Uh, so for this, we are using JavaScript library, which has a which uh, 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 which makes a connection to the Spire server uh, using the agent SOC file that is running uh, that is created by Spire agent or that runs on that same host. Uh, and with that, we have kind of integration between the broker and the, when the and the Spire server is done. So it kind of works out of the box. Uh, and we have to well, we have to change some configuration, but nothing that serious. Uh, so we have to, well, by integrating JavaScript library into the you know, Kafka broker, we all automatically get the uh, Spiffer Trust Manager and the uh, Key Manager implementation. So we can uh, say to the Kafka process that use uh, uh, Key Manager algorithm as Spiffer and Trust Manager algorithm uh, as Spiffer as well. So it will use uh, Spiffer Trust Manager and Key Managers. And we also tell Kafka to make the client SSL authentication as required. So we expect identity. On each of the, uh, on each of the, from each of the client. 
Uh, so from the how it would work in practice now that since we have this um, integration ready uh, on the microservice side, we'll have the it connected to Bootstrap servers and it will use localhost 9101 to make the connection. So it will make the connection to local Envoy on, as a plain text. So it doesn't really need to know or uh, it doesn't even expect to talk to broker over TLS. Uh, so it just makes a plain uh, text connection to Envoy on this port and Envoy will make a connection uh, to the Kafka broker. Uh, and it will upgrade the connection to MTLS because we have uh, Spire agents running on both uh, on both places. And obviously, Spire agents uh, on this microservice side and on the broker side, they both talk to the Spire server, and they get this uh, certificate rotation. Like they will get the uh, Spire server will manage all the rotations and will get all this kind of nice automatic setup out of the box. Now I will hand over to Jonathan, who will talk more in details how we run Envoy at TransferWise. Uh, thank you, Levani. Uh, so um, Levani mentioned uh, Envoy quite a lot there. Why, why Envoy and how we're we using it uh, at TransferWise? Well, uh, we already have Envoy in place. Uh, we have a full service mesh um, set up already. Uh, this is deployed across um, our entire state. So, um, across our Kubernetes clusters. Uh, it's present as a sidecar in all of our service pods. Um, it's deployed on EC2 instances where there are services running on various EC2 instances. It's deployed in various data centers around the world uh, where we're running services, um, some data centers. Um, this is used for all service to service calls and uh, those calls are already secured using SVIDs, X509 SVIDs provided by uh, Spire agent uh, via the Envoy SDS protocol. Um, this is driven by a, a homegrown control plane, um, but uh, as this is present everywhere across our infrastructure already, the components were already in place to just add Kafka support um, to this. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we go about adding Kafka support? Today, uh, as Valentin said, the Kafka brokers are static. Um, so we didn't even need to touch the control plane. Um, uh, Envoy configs are templatized. So Helm for uh, Kubernetes, Ginger 2 for everything else. Um, and so by having that static list of Kafka brokers for each of the clusters, we can just feed that into the templating and produce bootstrap configs, which already know about all the brokers. Static configuration is not ideal, um, but it was uh, an easy way to get started doing this and get it into production. So we avoided touching the control plane at all. Uh, next slide, please. So what does the uh, config do this look like? Well, um, we have a listener um, configured on Envoy for each broker that we need to talk to. Um, that listener has a cluster associated with it uh, for each listener. Um, each cluster has a single endpoint, which will be the Kafka broker that that listener is intended for. Uh, the listener is configured with the um, Envoy TCP proxy uh, filter. Um, and the cluster is configured to have a TLS transport socket. So that then pulls certificate uh, information and the trust bundle from uh, Spire agent via the Envoy SDS uh, API that the agent supports. Um, we've also got the listeners configured with the Kafka filter. Uh, this is completely optional. Um, it's um, not essential at all. Uh, we, it, all it, it doesn't do anything for routing traffic. All it does is parse the messages that they go by and produce some very basic metrics about messages. Uh, it's, it's nice to have uh, additional metrics, so that's why we have it turned on. And with this configuration, you now have a listener per um, broker. And so your bootstrap service on the client side would look something like localhost 9101, localhost 9102, and so on in this case. Uh, this is still not perfect because it means that the client still needs to be configured with this list of ports. Um, and if you want to renumber brokers or you want to remove brokers and things, you'd have to go around changing configurations. So we can make this slightly better and make bootstrapping even simpler. Uh, next slide, please. By uh, adding a, another listener uh, with a cluster that has an endpoint for every single broker. So you have this, in this example, um, 
a listener on 9100. If you connect that, it will connect you to one of the brokers that it knows about. So any one of the brokers. And that's enough for bootstrapping. That broker will return the cluster metadata, which will contain the um, advertised listeners for the rest of the cluster well, and itself. So that will give the client all of the individual ports that it needed to know to connect to the individual brokers. Uh, this means the configuration is as simple as having a single port in the bootstrap service for each client. And it's now completely oblivious to how many brokers are really behind uh, each of these bootstrap ports. Um, next slide. So what problems are with, with this? Well, the static broker configuration is far from ideal. Um, people want to deploy Kafka into Kubernetes clusters, for example, um, and other dynamic environments. Um, even adding new brokers at the moment is a pain. You have to uh, basically regenerate a large number of Envoy configs and redeploy them. Um, it's not as bad as having to change the client configuration uh, for every single service, but it's still not ideal. Um, we'll simply move the configuration into the control plane at some point in the future when this becomes a, a significant problem for us. It's not a showstopper. Uh, we just wanted to have the simplest sort of path to getting this into production that we, we could. And so avoiding touch on the control plane was the best way to do that. Uh, in terms of overhead, uh, there were worries that introducing Envoy into the mix would, um, would have some uh, high overhead. Uh, in reality, we found that offloading the TLS work to Envoy has better performance than using the Java native, uh, the Java client, uh, using TLS and that directly. Uh, anyone who's dealt with the Java TLS implementation knows that it's not known for its performance. So probably with hindsight, this shouldn't have been a surprise. Um, we actually have lower latency and higher throughput with uh, running it via Envoy. Uh, for other uh, Java, of course, we're, we're a Java shop primarily, so this was our main use case. So that's what we benchmarked most heavily. Um, for non-Java uh, implementations, we'd expect their own TLS implementations to be significantly better than the Java one. Uh, but in benchmarks, the overhead of um, MTLS via Envoy compared to just plain text straight to the broker uh, wasn't actually that high at all. I don't have any numbers, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, we found that insignificant enough for our use case that we don't believe that there's a problem with our languages either. Uh, next slide. So what did we gain from doing all of this? Um, well, unified service identity across our infrastructure, obviously a big win, spiffy IDs for everything. Um, so service calls are um, authenticated with the same uh, SVIDs as we use for connecting up to our Kafka clusters, which is brilliant. Um, introducing Envoy meant that we were able to do this without having to do any code changes on the client side. So we didn't have to introduce um, Java Spiffy, for example, or equivalents in other languages to our clients. Uh, we didn't have to add TLS support for the Kafka client libraries that don't have it uh, for a couple of languages. Um, and so uh, diverse clients not a problem either, because all of the client libraries support plain text out of the box. So you can just speak plain text to Envoy and it all works. And of course, the big win, no long lived certificates to manage anymore. Uh, everything is SVIDs managed by Spire, which was absolutely brilliant. So um, I've also included a couple of resources. Um, there's an example Envoy config, well, uh, a template for generating an example Envoy config um, in that GitHub repo. Um, another important component is the Kafka Spiffy principle uh, library. We didn't write this, but this converts, uh, this reads the Spiffy ID off an X509 SVID in Kafka and converts it to a Kafka principle. So you can then use it in the Kafka ACLs. That is obviously an important bit of this all. Um, and that's basically how we've secured access to our Kafka brokers using Spiffy at TransferWise. Uh, any questions? There are a few questions from the chat. I don't know if you rather read those or take them offline. Uh, maybe we can. Uh, take yeah, I can take them offline. That's probably easier to uh, spare some time. Great. Well, this is fascinating. Uh, Spiffy with Kafka is a very sought after and desired integration. Thanks for assembling the pieces and lighting the path for others to uh, be able to refer to the configuration about how you've gone about it. And also, well, the, the insights you've gained throughout the process.